Chuck T, Jeff Tucker, DVM. Uh, this is a presentation of my horse talk series on the horse's advocate. And with me is my wife, Kathy, over there. And next to me is my son, Matt. And we're going to work as a team to get this thing done if I don't push any more wrong buttons. All right. <clears throat> A recording this webinar will be available for free to anyone forever at the equinepractice.com forward slash horse talk. So that's a really easy URL to remember, the equinepractice.com forward slash horse talk. And I want to talk about barn and farm safety uh, for one simple reason. It saves you money and heartache. And prevention's the key. And there's an expression of pinch of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and that is absolutely the case in this situation. So uh, I had a couple of important thoughts I always put in front of these things. I'm not a veterinarian. Uh, in this case, it really isn't that specific because I'm not really talking about how to care uh, for your horse as a veterinarian. I'm just uh, letting you know what I know about horses. All right. Um, most of you know that I'm a horseman since 73 and a veterinarian since 84. And I've owned many horses and work for, uh, with horses. I'm a storyteller and a photographer. Uh, but I want to take a moment. Uh, before we go any further, and I want to play you a video. Would you uh, just take a moment and watch this video? And uh, it's going to take about two minutes, two and a half minutes. Hey everyone, this is Jeff Tucker. Thank you so much for watching the Horse Talk webcast. Uh, we're going to be recording uh, our Horse Talk webcast while you're sitting in your PJs and drinking coffee. Uh, I just appreciate the time that you spend. But I wanted to take a moment to tell you how long I've been doing this. Because right now it's May 1st, 2016. And I want to show you something. These are four proceeding booklets from what's called the I Love New York Horse Symposium. I'm going to bring this one out. I'm going to bring it up really close. Do you see that date? November 10th and 11th, 1979 at Cor Cornell University, sponsored by the Cornell Student Horsemen's Association. Now, I started that as an undergraduate at Cornell. Cornell Student Horseman Association was started because Cornell didn't have anything to do with horses. And I wanted to bring information to students because I'd already been working the thoroughbred world for five years. And I was assistant farm manager. So I was on track to becoming veterinarian, but I wasn't there yet. I wanted people to learn. So I started the I Love New York Horse Symposium. The first one in 1979 attracted over 500 people and filled up James Law Auditorium. That was incredible. The speakers came from all over the nation. It was a huge success. But I'll tell you something else. I wasn't done teaching just because I got into vet school. I'm going to show you something that's a little archaic. These things here are boxes that have reel to reel. That's colic and that's wounds. And I'm going to show you what's inside this box. <laughs> a lot of you guys don't even know what a reel to reel is. That is a reel to reel tape. This has the, the um, master of my talks on, on wounds and colic, and it turned into something that I started called Horse Talk Tapes. And Horse Talk was something I sold through Equus Magazine because it was just out. The World Wide Web wasn't, was just like nobody knew about it. This is 1992, all right? Look, look at, I don't know if you can see the copyright there. There it is, 1992, and this is what it looked like in 1992. That's me. Um, and inside of this box are the two cassette tapes, because that's how we all learned back then. We bought cassette tapes, and this is on colic and wounds. I was trying to get the message out of how important it was to take basic concepts and take care of your horse. And today, I'm still doing the same thing. I'm just doing with a new technology. So please, uh, you have to understand just how grateful I am that you're here listening to this because you are trying to be the advocate for your horse. You're trying to do the best thing for your horse, and this is a great place to start. So I just want to thank you for being here. So uh, enjoy. All right, I'm back live. Um, we're going to go over the top 10 horse barn safety tips. These are just um, about 100 and some odd uh, slides that we're going to fly through. And the reason we're going to fly through them is because I hope you have a pen and paper hanging around, pencil and paper, uh, or a notepad of some sort, and you're going to type down some of the ideas that come to you. Because I'm going to ask you a special question at the end of this, something I'd like you to do for, not for me so much as for all the other people, for your horses, and for yourselves. I'm going to ask you to pay attention to what I go through. Some of these things you're going to say, okay, I know all about these. Uh, some of them you say, wow, I never thought about that before. But I want you to see it 
uh, see them all. Here's your 10 subjects. I'm not going to go over them there. I'm just going to start right in because I started so late. So <clears throat> the first one is called fencing, fencing safety. And here's a picture of a wood board fence with a wire next to it. You can see the horse had been chewing. So this uh, barn has some uh, falling apart, some maintenance issues. Uh, but it also has the danger here with this wire that runs right next to the top board because when the horse starts chewing this, he could also get this wire in his mouth. And under the right circumstances, uh, usually when a horse spooks, they bolt and they could catch a tooth in there, their incisors or a canine, and that could cause some damage to the mouth. So I've got a whole bunch of uh, pictures of some bad fencing, but I want to start off by showing you what good fencing is. And this really nice farm is um, got several things I want to point out. First, this alleyway is between the two paddocks, and it's called a, a buffer zone. So when you put two horses out together and they don't like each other, they can't get to each other, they can't kick at each other, they basically leave each other apart. And I want to start off um, because I've had a couple of people comment on Facebook that horses don't be, belong behind the fence or in the stall. And I can understand that. Uh, they certainly weren't born raised there. Um, it's a man-made concept, a man-made idea. But in my world, uh, there are you know, hundreds of thousands of horses that are kept behind stalls, uh, walls, and fences. So let's try and make it safe because if we're going to be an advocate for a horse and we have to keep our horses in, in confined conditions, let's do it right. So there's a couple other things I want you to notice. The posts are on the outside of the paddock, so they have a smooth lining so if a horse gets running, he can um, not get uh, banged up against the, the posts. They, they can stay safe. They're not going to jam one of these posts in their shoulders and damage the muscle nerve or bone there, uh, which can be devastating for a horse. Also notice that the height of the first board is very far off the ground. So if a horse does end up laying down next to the fence, which several horses just automatically do, and they get their feet out underneath it, they're going to be able to get their feet back in without getting trapped. Now, on the converse, this is a bad fence for a foal because a foal can roll out from underneath here and be separated from its mother, and that can uh, lead to high anxiety on the farm. So that's uh, pretty much a sign of good fencing. Now, here's a fence that's a little bit in disarray. It's a combination of wood board and uh, electric tape. You can see the electric tape on the bottom boards, but you can see that the wire or tape has been taken off the top board and the insulators have been left there just hanging out. And these insulators are themselves a, a danger to the horse. Again, you once had a smooth side on the inside for the horse, and now you don't. Here's rubber fencing. Now, rubber fencing has pretty much gone by the, the wayside, um, but rubber fencing has a problem. But I'm going to show that to you in the next picture. Also notice that you've got a wire along the top and a wire along the middle. It's not tight. It's just kind of loose, and that can fall down. It's not in good repair. It has an insulator on the top of the post that shouldn't be there. Again, a horse would get caught with a, a halter that's left on or just suddenly turn and, and smack himself there. Uh, and also notice that the paddock is mostly sand, so this horse doesn't have any uh, place to get away from the sand, which he can ingest and create some sand colic. So lots of things going on in this uh, picture. But let's take a look at this rubber uh, belting that's used. It's kind of hard to see in this picture other than you can see all the cracks and how uh, destroyed it is uh, through wear and, and sunshine. But here's another view of it and I want you to look at the edge here, the very edge as it goes around the, the post. Do you see those little white tags there? Those are nylon fibers and they're non-digestible. And the problem with this rubber fencing that's uh, basically a byproduct of the um, industry that uses belts, conveyor belts, is they, they turn in strips and they, and they make fences out of it. Um, this little uh, nylon stuff can get in the gut and it never comes out. And then it becomes a seed. And on top of that seed rolls a ball of manure. And a ball of manure can be, get very big to the point where it blocks the intestines and the horse severely colics and needs surgery. And some of these have actually become as big as uh, basketballs. Um, and it's very painful for these horses. Um, I found a manufacturer that repurposes materials and they repurposed these things and had fencing available. And I sent a letter to the uh, president of the company telling him that this is not a good idea. And he had never heard of that because he's not a horseman, but he saw an opportunity. So you got to be aware of stuff like that. Okay, here's another fence with a, a post that has no protection on top. I've seen horses actually rear up trying to get it, other horses on the other side, come down on these stakes and um, 
uh, severe injury and death has occurred uh, as horses come down. It's like a sword going in their chest. You also see the insulator keeps the um, electric wire out a good distance. Um, I don't know if there's any pros or cons to that. Again, it's not a very smooth interior. And also notice that fencing they use is a box. And this box wire is big enough for a horse, especially a small horse, a pony, a mini, a foal to get their foot through, especially if they lay down close to it. So a box fence like this is really not safe for your horse. On the other hand, they do make T-tops. These post tops go up here. And this is, uh, the horse will probably get a nice bruise. Um, but it still hurts. And the funny thing was the picture I showed you just before that, I turned my camera to the left and I just turned to the right and that was the next post over. So they knew about these post tops, but they weren't on every post. So it was dangerous. Um, now here's a, an electric woven wire. Uh, this is a very hot wire, but it's made up of very fine wires. Uh, so it basically is a virtual border for the horse. They know that it's hot. They don't want to touch it. Uh, but if they end up running, if they're in a fit, a blind uh, running fit, they can hit this and just break through it. It's, it's really not that strong. So it's a lot of people like this. A lot of people think that it's a, it's a good, good fence. And she's uh, maintained it in really good condition. Uh, notice how taut the um, lines are. She also has here a buffer between the two paddocks. It's roped off. Um, I guess to keep other people out or something out, but basically she has buffers between the two paddocks, which is excellent. Here's a really nice fence line with a decorative cap on top, but again, on the paddock side are the posts, so they don't have a smooth border. They put electric wire, which is in good condition on the inside, uh, but the board and the face board on the outside is just for decoration and really doesn't help anything. I just want to make a small mention of wire because I'm not a big fan of using wire. It's very popular because it's extremely inexpensive uh, and can easily be put up in no time at all. You can rope a lot of things in. Uh, this is a heavier gauge wire that's in really good uh, condition. The top one is insulated, so it's electrified, and the next one is not, and then the one below that is, and then the two below that are not. So she's done a really good job of fencing horses in with uh, high tension wire. Uh, again, I've seen horses get their feet through this uh, and then wrap it up um, and, and the horse die from it because uh, it becomes a, a wire that just cuts. Uh, I don't want to get into a lot of details, but it's not good. This is an interesting picture of a wire fence. And if you can't see the wire fence, that's the point of the picture. Here's a horse that's just sleepily uh, grazing, um, hanging out. But what happens if it's nighttime? They don't even see this fence. Um, or if their vision isn't good, or if they're looking someplace else at something that's chasing them, they're going to hit this wire fence, and it's going to do a lot of damage. And, of course, here's barbed wire. And all I know is uh, the reason we use cow hides is because it's tough. And I've seen cows go right through barbed wire and leave little tufts of hair, and the wire is in shambles. But as soon as a horse goes through barbed wire, it's a meat cutter and it's no good and it's it should be outlawed uh, for every horse and here's a horse standing behind it looks like six or seven or eight wires um, and this horse if it ran through it uh, would be dead so uh, there's no excuse to be using a uh, barbed wire for horses uh, that's just my opinion as a veterinarian he's been around a long long time now there's a lot of people who use pipe for fencing and pipe seems pretty sturdy um, I can't see a reason not to use it here's um here's a pipe that's welded uh, and in the, in the western states where there's oil and there's a lot of pipe left over, uh, it's a surplus. It becomes a cheap form of fencing. Note also how they took this tractor tire and inverted it and made a hay feeder out of it. I thought that was ingenious. If a horse falls into that, uh, it just collapses and uh, except a little bruising, no one really gets hurt. Here's again a decorative fence. Uh, someone's cut, cut the top posts at an angle to make it look good, but that's all on the inside of the paddock. On the driveway side is the face board and the flat boards, so it really is all decorative and for human consumption. On the flip side, here's a horse um, uh, paddock that has the flat boards on the inside. Then they've also put a face board, and face boards are not only decorative, but they help hold the fence together, and they've used a 6x6 six six post, which is just incredible. Nothing's going to get through this uh, fence line. Also note that the uh, chain that they've used here is just a loop of chain that goes through and around. 
this is a crazy way to do it. They've invested thousands of dollars in a really good fence and a lousy gate latching system. And I'll get into a much better way to do gate latching that's not going to cost you more than a dime to, to put together. This is a very safe and effective fence. It's called um, a diamond mesh. They used to call it the secretary fence because it's made for secretariat back in the 70s and uh, he became the spokesperson for it. Also notice the, the corner of this paddock has been rounded off so if you have two horses out in a corner they're not going to get trapped. Um, they have an escape route. Here's a close-up of it. Uh, the diamond mesh is very strong. There's not a horse I know that can go through it nor have I seen a horse that's ever been caught up in it because all the little uh, holes in it are very small. So it's a really good fence if you can afford it. They put it up with a board so it looks very good, very decorative. The, um, the boards allow the horse to see it. And um, if I uh, had my druthers, that's the type of fencing I'd like to go with. Here's a farm that uh, decided they had enough wood chewers and they took PVC piping and actually cut a, a, a groove out of it, a section out of it, and topped, uh, topped their fence with it. And here's a close-up of it. They've actually screwed it in. Uh, and then took caulking and, and caulked in all the blank places. So these horses really didn't have a good place to go ahead and bite. They basically left this fence alone. So that's kind of interesting. I've never seen that on any other farm. Uh, I think it's labor intensive to put in, um, but I think it will keep your fences looking pretty good. Here's the vinyl fence, and this is what I call um, a higher quality fence because this has three wires in it. It has a top and bottom and a middle wire. And they've kept it together really well. They've got the tensioners in here, and they keep everything pretty well snug, and it looks really good. The nice thing about this fence is the horse can run into it, and they basically bounce off of it. Uh, the bad thing, again, is they put the fence posts on the inside on this one. Uh, but if you look at the fence in the background, uh, the fence posts are on the outside. But a lot of people will take uh, the fence and make it look good on the, on the uh, driveway side, which is where I'm standing. So I think it's uh, kind of silly, but that's what they did. Now I want to show you another vinyl fence, and look how twisted and droopy this one is. Um, and here's a close-up of it. The top one has been chewed or rubbed against um, and just curled up to nothing. This only has two wires, one on top and bottom. Uh, but again, the wires are encased in vinyl, so it becomes very safe for the horse. I just want to show you a few more fences. Here's a fence line that's definitely in disarray. Um, the boards have warped. They've taken the nails, and even though this is a twist nail, which should be really strong, um, in the Florida heat, um, these boards just twist uh, almost 90 degrees, certainly 45 degrees here, and they just pull these nails out with the greatest of ease, and it's a constant battle. These boards are worthless. You have to throw them out and put new boards up, um, and it's a constant, never any battle. Also, uh, in farms where there's a lot of wood chewing, um, these boards just look awful. Um, and they look dangerous. And the horses, if they're running, it just is a, a nightmare. This cat likes it, apparently. But you can see the middle board has been chewed down into a, a stake or spike that if the horse did get in a situation where it ran into these points, it would penetrate the skin. All right, that's it for... Um, fence lines. I spent a lot of time there because so many horses are behind fences that I want you all to just kind of take a, some time and think about it and scribble down some uh, ideas on your notepad. They're either going to come under uh, one or two categories. One is um, my fence is in disrepair and I have to spend time to repair it. The other is I wish I could win the lottery and replace my fence. Uh, fences are very expensive, so are vet bills, and so is the heartache of putting in all your training uh, to get your, keep your horse going. And one night, a um, uh, coyote or something gets out there and stirs up the horses, and they run through it, and, um, and then they're gone. So let's talk about the second place where they spend the most time, and this is um, a sandwich board. This is a stall wall that's obviously in disarray. Um, this vertical board that's off is what I call the sandwich board. And I love to talk about sandwich boards. And I'm going to take uh, exactly three minutes to uh, play this video. And I want you to just uh, pay attention to a little ditty I put together to explain what a sand sandwich board is. Hi, the Equine Practice proudly presents Ask Doc T, another five minute guide. This is about sandwich boards. I want you to look at the stall wall in different perspectives. There's three dimensions. And this is looking straight down as. Oh, sorry, gang. I uh, messed up.
Hi, the Equine so we got to start again. Proudly presents Ask Doc T, another five-minute guide. This is about sandwich. Oh, I can't believe it! I just touched my mouse and the thing goes away. Hi, oh. the Equine Practice proudly presents Ask Doc T, another five-minute guide. This is about sandwich boards. I want you to look at the stall wall in different perspectives. There's three dimensions, and this is looking straight down as if you were a bird looking down on the stall wall. And on the left and on the right are channel. Channel locks are, or I should say, these channels here, right here, are little uh, cup holders that hold the boards. And here you can see a board right along here has been Now if you turn this around so you're looking sideways, here's a stall wall here, and here's another stall wall here, and down here is your first board. Here's your second board, third board, and they're just placed into the slack, really held in place. They're not glued in here, they're not nailed, there's nothing holding these boards but gravity going straight down, holding these in place. This is how it looks as if you were in the stall wall looking straight out. Here, this white uh, container is the channel, and here's your first board, your second board, your third board, your fourth board, all stacked nicely on top of each other. Here, again, is the bird's eye view of the channel on each side, and here's one board I've illustrated in red, and you can see that it's no longer straight, it's bowed. Here's another board that's bowed the other way. Do you see this gap in here? This is a potential gap for a horse to catch its foot under. In other words, if his foot was right here and he could get underneath his board, he could actually lift this stack. Here, let me see if I can uh, just uh, draw this a little bit right here. This board, let's say, is this board right here. And this board is now bowed out right here. So a horse's leg could come right up in this direction and catch it and lift it straight up lifting all these boards going straight up. So here's the horse, here's the board uh, that's bowed out, and here's the horse's hind leg, and here's its toe catching that board, and he's going to be pushing up as he tries to push himself away from the wall. I'm going to lift that board off, and you can see now that his, his foot has slid completely through. What's going to happen is gravity is going to take this down, and it's going to guillotine. And guillotine is an awful, awful word. It's what uh, was used in the French uh, Revolution to chop uh, off people's heads. And this is going to come down and it's going to guillotine this horse. And he's going to be unable to lift this stack of wood back up. Remember, there's many boards, more boards on top of this. And that extra weight holds that leg down. And the horse can't end up pushing it back. So this is the idea of a sandwich board. It is a vertical board placed right in here, and it has several nails or bolts that come through, and it sandwiches these boards together. So no longer can this foot go up and push this out of the way. All right, so that's sandwich boards, and I want to give you a couple examples. Here's a, a bowing board right here, and it doesn't have to bow much. Um, in this case, the bow is into the stall, but on the other side, it's bowed the other way, and a horse can actually easily lift uh, four or five boards straight up in these channels right here, and then, uh, and then it just comes down, and they're trapped, and um, horrible, horrible uh, fate awaits the horse that that happens to uh, because it's usually sometime in the middle of the night. Here's a, a, a board that is beautifully sandwiched here. They have the upper boards um, uh, slatted out so the horses can see each other, a little bit more airflow. But they put a sandwich board in here for stability, and you can see the bolts are driven right through each one of these. Here's another example of sandwich boards. Uh, this is a prefab uh, with two vertical, uh, I call them sandwich boards, but in this case, the middle. Uh, here's another sandwich um, board. This middle is actually a, a post that holds the roof up, and then they made the channels. But notice that each short board is now bolted in with two uh, bolts. Uh, this is a heavy-duty um, wall that's put together with a nice airspace down here in South Florida. Here's another uh, channel, um, uh, metal channel that's uh, holding this uh, wall together, and they have nice slats going through to let a little bit of air through.
This one's another interesting one. It's a whole metal frame that goes all the way around with a metal frame that goes down the middle, and then they just plop these boards in. Um, it's a prefab thing, which is a kind of nice way to uh, make these these stall walls. Stall walls uh, also need to be kept in, in good repair. Here's one uh, on the stall side, and you can see the bottom one, even with the sandwich board, is bowing out. And what you can't see is the one below it is actually rotted. And this is just comes from um, the, the wear and tear and the rotting of the urine. And this is the outside of what it looks like. And obviously a horse's leg uh, in sleep could get out underneath here and be outside the stall. Also notice how this has taken the conduit here for the electric and just pulled it right off the pipe and you can't see it here but you can actually see the wires coming out of that ground pipe going into the junction box. So that's not good. Here's a solid wall. Um, a lot of barns that are built into the earth. Um, the farmer will build these uh, solid walls out of stone and then um, and then build what he can inside. And here, what's really interesting is these are vertical boards. They're no longer horizontal. Vertical boards never bow, and I can't explain it why. I'm sure in my mind it, I've got to explain, but vertical boards seem to be so much stronger. And if you can do it, uh, that might be a way to go. Uh, this is another board. Um, this is a tray that you see saddlebred um, barns have. Um, this is a this keeps their tail set away from the stall wall. So when they back up, their hind legs touch this uh, vertical plywood and they can't take their beautiful tails and rub them against the wall. I'll tell you another thing. I'm going to have a little ditty on uh, casting rails, but I want you to remember this. If a horse gets over here and has this vertical wall kind of tilted like this, what's really nice is it forces them to stay away from the vertical wall just by definition it's he's got to stay way out away from that so and even if he does hit cast he can slide his feet up and it'll catch right underneath his board he'll be able to push himself away if you guys don't know what casting is I'm going to explain that in a little bit now these are the nemesis this is the thing that just drives me batty everybody seems to put these vertical bars in stalls they seem so common and it should be like easy to to say that it's good some people might think that it looks like a jail cell but you know what horses do and not all of them but some of them do they turn their head 90 degrees and they bite these bars and so they have their mandible on one side and their muzzle on the other side and they're actually biting these things and then somebody come somebody comes by and surprises them and uh, snap goes the jaw and I've seen several broken jaws from this so vertical bars are really not good I try to stay away from them. This is an interesting setup. Uh, the bottom half of the wall is solid cement, which is a good solid wall. You'll never get a bowling board in that or anything like that. But she had vertical bars on this, and to overcome the problem, these vertical bars, which were widespread, she she took t um, these gates and superimposed them. So now they have a smaller slat, and the smaller slat actually prevented the horse from getting their teeth or their mouth around these vertical bars. So it's a kind of an ingenious way to do this. Um, there's something called hog panels, which I'll show you in a little bit, but hog panels do a really good job of, of covering up places like that. Here's steel rebar, and everybody thinks rebar is really strong, but I'll tell you what, it's very, very uh, soft metal. And you can see how easily this horse has bowed these things out, either by its mouth or somehow just bowed them out, and these are no longer effective. Here's a close-up and see how they can get their mouth right through there and bite it some more. And forget about just their mouth. They can actually kick at each other, and the hoof can go right through there, and again, it's, it's stuck. Now, here's a thicker rebar. It's actually at the same farm. I guess this guy was into making cement forms, and he had this thicker rebar that he put, and then he put um, uh, plywood right behind it. So actually, this one isn't as bad because the horse can't get its mouth around it or can't do anything around here. So if you have a bar so you want to make it safe right away, you can put a board up here uh, so the horse can't get to it. Um, put it on the same size as a stall, so if they do kick, they're not going to stick their foot through the rebar. Here's some more rebar with a, a horizontal uh, tightener, but again, you can see how they're just uh, bowling these things out. And of course, as you bow them out, the tops and bottoms uh, come loose, and now you have a completely blank area here 
and uh, over on the left hand side and now a horse can really stick his muzzle through and this will cause uh, more trouble in some farms. This farm here has uh, what I call hog pa panels and they're square. True hog panels actually the bottom uh, horizontal bars are much smaller together and gradually increase in spacing as it goes up. These are made out of quarter inch steel and there's nothing you can do to these things. I had my horses behind them for years and you couldn't beat them. They're, they did, they looked as good uh, 15 years later as the day I bought them other than the dirt that was on them. Here again is a beautiful barn with a nice electrical outlet, recessed uh, place of the cord, uh, recessed water uh, faucets to fill the water buckets up. Everything's fine on here and yet still it's vertical bars and this horse is bringing his muzzle right up there and all he has to do is to cock his head almost 90 degrees and wrap his incisors around there and you've got a problem. But on this other side you can see this really deep V uh, as a gate or as a window guard so the horse can get his head out but he still can't um, and he's probably less likely to put his mouth around here. But my thoughts are if you're going to have that big a, a, a V-notch why not just take the whole thing down. So that's it. Um, if anybody has any questions um, you certainly can uh, shoot them off to me but right now um, I want to move on to casting rails. And This is a great picture of a casting rail, this black uh, manufactured rubber a uh, ridge that's put all the way around the stall can help a horse that's laid down too close to the wall and, and he rolls over so his feet are sticking up on the wall and he can't roll back. I've got a real good video on how to uncast a horse uh, and you can be 90 pounds uh, and still do it. You don't have to be a big hunk and you don't have to get in there where the feet are flying. A lot of people don't know how to get rid or take care of a horse that's cast but if you go uh, to the horse advocate and look up casting horse. I've got a nice video on that. It's been seen a lot. It's also on YouTube. If you uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, there's a big hint for you guys. All right, let me show you a barn that was built after I told her about casting rails. And she incorporated this ridge that goes all the way around and did a really nice job. I think it's pretty wonderful, but there's a couple other things I want to show you about this stall wall. Yes, she has vertical bars. I understand that. But that said, she also uses tongue and groove. You'll notice that there's no vertical sandwich board here because uh, boards that have a groove in their bottom and a tongue on the top and you tap them together fit like a hand in a glove and you stack these together and then square it off on top with this framed uh, in metal um, bar system and this wall isn't going anywhere. They're very solid, very durable and I've seen these last forever. So if you want to use tongue and groove it's a little bit more expensive wood but it really holds up and does a good job. Here's another close-up of how she incorporated this uh, casting rail all the way around. Here's another casting rail again the manufactured ones against a solid vertical uh, hardwood uh, stall wall and she takes it around on the other side against the uh, cement. She just drilled it right in there and attached it. So this horse uh, has a lot of places where they can catch their feet in and, and take care of them. So casting again uh, can be very distressful on a horse and this is a great way if you have a horse that does that to, um, uh, to not get cast. Okay, let's move on to bucket safety. I know this, this sounds kind of crazy but here's two buckets hanging on a wall. Uh, it's kind of dirty and grungy, but I want you to notice how they're hanging the thumb snaps on the left hand bucket versus the right hand. Now the right hand is perfect. They've got the thumb latches facing in, but the left one isn't. The thumb latches are facing out. And what's so important about that? Well, there's a veterinarian at a racetrack a while ago, a couple of decades now, who couldn't understand why he was having all these horses get eyelid lacerations, you know, where half their eyelid was ripped off. And he did his own little... Uh, intelligence gathering and what he came up with was if you could get these thumb latches <coughs> pardon me to face in and that would eliminate a lot of the problems and the other is where the handle attaches to the bucket and this is a classic example of a of a wire loop that goes through that has an exposed end and these horses start itching their face and they get their eyelid caught, caught in these things and they damage themselves so there are two problems here thumb latches the wrong way and open wire on the uh, bucket. Now here again is another setup. The left side is done right, the right side is not. And again, uh, some manufacturers put these plastic caps on and that helped diminish the space 
and made it smooth so they didn't uh, get their eyelids caught as well. There's a cheap solution that these bucket manufacturers did, but you can see on the right hand side how it just came off on this one. So here's all uh, three buckets lined up. All three have the um, the thumb latches facing the correct way, but again, the bucket uh, wire handles are still facing the wrong way. And there are two minis at this one barn, and this is this gal's solution on how to hang a bucket to make it safe for these minis. And she just got it download, and she put a, a bolt, a, a lag screw um, in the top of the pole and just put it on there. And it seemed to work, so um, I'm sure that when the bucket gets empty and the, the pony's looking for it, they just toss it off and then they play kickball with it. But that looked pretty good. Here again is disarray. The, the snap's not even on. There's obviously no care at this barn. It's, it's a dirty, ugly place. But I'll show you what this person did. They took electrical tape and they taped these things up. And this is so easy to do. You could run right out after this um, webcast and go out there and do this and make your horse's um, bucket safer just with this one little move. Um, here a manufacturer uh, actually incorporated the wire loop of the handle behind a plastic guard. And this is basically to prevent eyelid lacerations. Um, although they don't really announce it, they just might call it a safety bucket or something, but that's exactly what it is. And notice the hanger that is hanging off the uh, eye of the wall. They've got this really neat hanger. Uh, they're actually a pain in the butt sometimes to hook and unhook because it takes two hands. But um, uh, it keeps, it's pretty safe. That, that I haven't seen any problems with this, unless of course, they put it on the wrong way. And here this person has faced it out and it has open wire bucket handles and this just isn't a good combination any way you want to look at it. Here's uh, another set of buckets and notice that somebody had came up with an idea of getting a fabric uh, with Velcro um, to wrap around these edges. And I'll show you close up that in a second, but notice how they've got these hanging off the wall. This um, type of hanger is actually kind of cool. I've never seen these become a problem anywhere. Maybe somebody has, but I haven't. Uh, the only biggest problem with these is uh, unhooking a full bucket of water. It can be really um, very difficult unless you're not, you know, especially if you're short or you don't have much strength to lift a full bucket and unhook these. Here's a close up of the little Velcro uh, fabric things. Um, and they're good. They, they can sometimes slide up. Um, I saw these in a barn and then uh, a couple of years later I have not seen them so I don't think they're long lived. Here's a, a horse that uh, cribs on his buckets and it creates a problem so they lowered it and they hooked them up. They hooked them up properly uh, but they keep the, the buckets right on the ground and this way um, the horse can't uh, windsuck or crib on them. And here of course is probably a perfect setup. You've got the uh, duct tape that's taped the edges so uh, the horse isn't going to catch their eye there. The thumb snaps are in the right direction and the vertical uh, pipes or water pipes, they just turn a valve on and the water fills them up. It's a really nice setup here. Okay, let's move into barn lighting. And barn lighting is one of these things that, yeah, there's some safety involved with it and I want to show you why there's safety involved. Um, and basically, I'm going to tell you that most Barns are wired by electricians and not by horsemen. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. <clears throat> this is the most beautiful setup I've seen as far as lighting goes. I've never seen anything like it. Um, you see how the fluorescent lights are kept off to the side. They're angled at 45 degrees. It lights the room up beautifully. But most importantly, there's nothing going over the top. Going over the top does two things. Not only does it cast a shadow down the sides of the horse at night, but it also is a magnet for heads, and heads go up and they hit them. And so this is a really nice system. Here's a close-up of it, how they just bolted them in the side. And if you're building a barn, I'd really recommend doing it that way. Here's another lighting fixture above a uh, grooming stall. Now, this lighting fixture is probably about 14 feet up, and that horse would have to rear up on his hind legs um, as far as it could to smack, smack this thing. So they're getting away with it and I'm not really you know worried about it safety wise I don't think it does a very good job lighting because in this barn here's a grooming stall and notice how they angle the lights too and they have one on the other side as well this is a much better way to light your horse from the side so you can see everything uh, without it casting shadow this is cheap this is expensive because it takes two but I'll show you why I as an equine dentist hate lights right over the middle of the stall Here's a horse that um, the whole time we're working on it, 
for some reason their head always stays right in the middle and it it looks like it's going to go up and smash this now in this case it's pretty far up but we've had them only inches and I've had to take the whole lighting structure off the globe the light bulb turn the electricity off um, to make sure that if the horse does go up and smack his head on the ceiling it's not going to create a problem so uh, these things are installed by electricians not by horsemen uh, it casts shadows everywhere I think I'm being redundant here here's another barn that Melissa and I were in we did not do this this is not from us but this is just such a perfect example of why you don't put a light fixture in the middle of a stall it just doesn't make sense here um, they, they have open rafters and the open rafters uh, down here in Florida uh, make for a light nice airflow uh, but what this person decided to do is put the light up in the rafters so now it's vertical um, but it gives a lot of light and it's out of the way the horse could rear up but it's going to be hard to hit this this is another view of it they're going to have to go through this um, beam uh, or they have to go around the side it's just not going to happen likelihood is much less I thought it was a pretty ingenious way of taking care of it now here's something really cool if you look above the stall wall which by the way has sandwich boards and is tongue and groove you'll see a light that runs along the ceiling the length of the stall wall what's really nice about that is one unit is sharing light on two stalls and if you look through the bars you're going to see another unit uh, between the next two stalls and I've seen a lot of farms do that it's a way of using one light uh, to share with two stalls uh, and it diminishes the cost the advantages of course are great but the disadvantage is if you have a horse that wants to get up in here in between the space it could knock this unit down and do damage so um, those are my lighting ideas and I'm gonna move on to the next one we are already at um, almost uh, the end of my my time so I'm gonna keep moving fast here fire prevention I can't tell you uh, I don't even have to tell you how devastating it is to have a barn fire and a lot of farms are now putting in these uh, sprinkler systems this one is the only barn I've ever seen that has orange PVC pipe uh, but it must be some sort of special code in this barn uh, or it's art deco I don't know but it's pretty bright most of them use um, iron piping uh, here is the um, better way of doing things you can't even see it here but if you look in the very lower left hand corner right above my watermark you're gonna see the silver fire extinguisher and this is what it takes you know you could go out this weekend to your uh, local um, uh, store um, what do you call them? the stores home yeah well I didn't want to say Home Depot but anyway fine Home Depot uh, and get yourself some fire extinguishers here's another view of it there's a red one down on the floor and then to the right of the yellow cord you're gonna see that just edge of that silver one I showed you in the previous one these guys had fire extinguishers throughout the barn and I thought that was brilliant because if somebody's there they can grab it and put a fire out immediately now of course you have to have them charged up and ready to go here you can see the iron pipe in the in the ceiling there's two of them running the length of this barn uh, this is in the hayloft a great place to have um, a sprinkler system because that's where most barn fires start some people are putting these heat detectors they can detect obviously the red wires uh, send off to a signal and in this case it sent it off to this box on the outside uh, or if you see a fire you can just pull and uh, the fire alarm goes off and here's another farm with a big red bell on the outside uh, these guys are really set up for fire prevention this one was just a, a amazing this is all this piping is just this huge water line that's coming out of the ground and this goes up and is piped through the whole barn it's got all sorts of pressure gauges and warnings if something's not right and valves it's just an amazing system and of course uh, some places have sophisticated alarm systems uh, to let everybody know if there's any problem in their barn um, as you can see in this electrical panel in the tack room so fire safety is basically um, make sure that you've got uh, fire extinguishers or if you can afford to put a sprinkler system in that's great um, but fires are always a, a problem on farms and right here is, is another reason uh, second to hay uh, it's improper use of electricity and here's a fan cord there's no extension cord which is really good but it's plugged into a light bulb outlet and light bulbs um, 
can be on a 15 watt circuit and these things can draw more than 15 watts and as, as you start increasing the wattage you can actually create uh, some heat in the wires and so this really isn't a good setup and, and as you can see the wall it's in filthy condition. Here's a, a fan being used with an extension cord that is just insane. Uh, these extension cords are usually made poorly they can get some restrictions and when you have a restriction in there uh, or it's not a big enough cord you can create heat and the heat can cause problems but also note that it's going right past where the horse can chew it and if you don't think horses will chew wire guess again because here's this horse and you can see the notch of wood where it's been cribbing on there and I reached through and actually chewed this cord um, and I was just like are you kidding me I mean here's a horse just trying to electrocute himself so that's crazy make sure your cords are out of the way don't use extension cords and wire them properly Here's a conduit wired system that looks really good, a nice junction box up high where you can hang a fan. And this person decided to drop some extension cords. And again, extension cords <clears throat> through a multiple outlet plug that's going into junction box is just circumventing some of the ideas of safety. This one is really neat. What a great idea this person has. If you can see way up at the top, <clears throat> there's your conduit, there's your uh, conduit looping down and the steel goes down between the stalls and way down here about a foot foot and a half off the ground here's your outlet and your switches now these down here are completely out of the way of the horse the horse cannot bite them and and most people put the switch right up here because again electricians are working in here they put them right up here what's convenient for us and also for the horse's mouth this person dropped them way down here I thought it was brilliant brilliant way of taking care of things and this is a beautifully um, installed uh, conduit system with a junction box right here over the stall wall where you could drop a cord to a fan uh, or keep a fan up here if you want to add a fan here. This is the way it should be done. The only complaint I have is that the light bulb is in a cage over the middle of the stall. Again, an electrician at work. All I had to do is take this and rotate it up and put it on the side of this board and you'd have a better better view of it or just run up the rafter and put it up here on the ceiling and that would be a much better and safer way. <clears throat> Here's some uh, plastic um, conduit. Um, I don't know all the codes of every place that I go to but again see how neatly this is put together from a junction box going right to the fan and right to the electrical outlet. Everything's nice and wired and rat proof and damage proof and that's the way to do things. Here again um, is a bunch of extension cords plugged into an outlet that was put up there for a reason so you can mount your fans and she's taken it to do something else. Um, notice that these boards are on a telephone pole and this stall board is just amazingly strong but on the top board you're going to see a nail sticking out. Again your eagle eyes have to be out there and find these things because if your eyes just get used to everything that you see, you're going to miss stuff like that. This is a, a really lousy place, and this is just one of two pictures, actually a bunch of pictures. I'm going to show you the place of filth and disrepair. And here's a nice junction box with a conduit put in, but they've attached to this conduit the um, insect, insect spraying uh, tube, and they've also stretched uh, wires across the ceiling, plug into these things. And, of course, they're dirty, and dirt can uh, ignite. Um, here is their junction box. Uh, this is just a nightmare and notice uh, how dirty everything is and uh, they've got an old pole leaning up against underneath and they've got the hose hanging on the uh, fire extinguisher and I'll bet you a dollar the fire extinguisher is non-functional and they've got no smoking stuck behind the whole thing and extension cords everywhere. This was just a disaster. Here's a nice junction box. Everything goes into it nice and uh, clearly. It's away from the horse. The horse can't get to it. I just don't like the idea that it's sitting right next to the outside water and the rain that comes in, but uh, apparently the electrician didn't have a bother with that. But I like uh, clean things that are inside, in, uh, well um, uh, away from the environment. Uh, look at all this beautiful conduit that they've got going up into the, in the ceiling. Nice uh, angled junction boxes. Also notice um, that they place all the uh, fire, like you see the heat detector way up in the ceiling, the blue and white, it has this red wire coming down and, and it's drilled through the trusses, that's the way it should be instead of suspended on the bottom. Uh, they've got these two major lines of sprinkler systems and a beautiful lighting. This is just a well done barn. 
yes, it costs money, but um, that's never gonna never gonna fade. This is a beautiful little utility room. It has a hot water heater, has all your electrical panels, it has this well. Everything's built into this nice room, beautiful junction boxes. <clears throat> and um, maybe you women out there uh, don't don't look at it the same way I look at these things. But if you love your horses, this is the way you want your utility and your electrical uh, outlets to be. This is perfect. Okay, filthy environment. I'm going to blow through this really fast because we've all seen lousy places, and this is just laziness on humans' part. Uh, they haven't cleaned the stall at all. These uh, white little kick mats that they've got are just streaked with manure and urine. Uh, it's just a filth place. This is the same stall, and this is the ceiling with holes where the horse is reared up and punches head through the um, sheetrock that's up here. It's never been repaired. It's a it's just a trap of dirt and and cobwebs. Uh, again, the they put a grate up or metal bars in front of the window, and, he, and the horse is still able to break two of the panes. You can see how the white kick mats are just held up with baling twine. Now. I know that it costs money to do things right. Don't get me wrong. I understand that. But it doesn't take anything but your energy to clean up all this mess and make a, a good environment if your horse has to stay in here. He's just, he's got to have a great place. Yes, this is the tack room. Yes, I can't believe it. This is filth. This is more filth. This is amazing. Uh, I couldn't believe it. Uh, it I know there's so many programs out there that would die just to have half this tack so they could run their ponies around. And, and this place is just, I just, it's just beyond words. Uh, here's, again, vertical bars that we've already gone over that are bad. But look how this window is just blocked with cobwebs. It's just, um, it's just unbelievable. There's cobwebs everywhere in every corner of the stall. Um, uh, covering the window. Here's Melissa trying to work and look at the cobwebs over this horse's head and look at the paint peeling off the wall. <clears throat> and what you can't see in this picture is the searing in our lungs going on because they had absolutely no ventilation um, and all we're breathing was uh, fumes of urine. And of course this is the watering, <clears throat> automatic water for this particular stall. Uh, obviously uh, in disrepair, not attached anymore. They did have a bucket for the water in there. But <clears throat> are these dangers in the stall? Yes, I think they are because of one reason. If you can't clean up the mess and keep the horse in a really good spot, then you're going to let a lot of other things slide. And this is just indicative of a problem that's about to happen. Here's some really dangerous things, just general uh, things that you see. I didn't have any category to put them in, but here's a nail that just worked its way out. It's about 12 inches off the ground. And I was floating this horse and I looked down and I just stopped everything. I said, grab me a hammer. We got to nail that one in. But I took a picture of it before I did. Here's a sandwich board that somebody actually took the time to drill out a place for the nut to actually set in. And then once he got the nut on the bolt and created the sandwich board, then they uh, sawed off the, the uh, remaining bolt and made it flush. This is a really good effort, and this took a lot of time to grind this down and get this done, but it really pay, pays off. On the flip side, here's another uh, lou lousy place. See this little cord here? This is holding some sort of salt block. We all love our salt blocks hanging, hanging on a cord, but you don't want it to be looking like this. And all the dirt and debris, but do you notice the nail sticking up? This is where the horse is placing his head every day to eat and all the slop that's going down the wall and there's the nail it's sticking up right there. Any place it can catch his halter, it can catch his skin, it can catch his eye. Here's um, a sandwich board but it's been pushed out and the nails have been coming out and these are so frustrating because you take your hammer and you nail them back in and they come back a month later and they all work themselves out again. You've got to come up with a better system, either take a bolt and go through there and put it together or not. Here's a uh, salt lick, and a, for, for the life of me, I can't understand why people do this. They put these wire salt block holders up, and then for some reason, they don't put it with salt. The horse bangs up against it, crushes it, then it gets all corroded. Then these things break down into sharp shards, almost like daggers, and they leave them up there. This should be taken down right away. It's a danger about to happen. Here this farm has put uh, silver channel of uh, silver, uh, metal channels over the top to prevent the horses from chewing. And instead what's happened is they chew anyway 
and they've caught this and they've eroded it and it's decayed and you can see fibers up here from where he's uh, rubbed uh, cloth you know maybe it's halter or blanket or something but this is just disarray and it needs to be repaired here's a worn out plastic feeder and believe me this is a very sharp edge and yet they keep feeding off of it it's a corner feeder this needs to either be repaired or replaced here's somebody put a screw eye in on the other side and never thought that this was pointing out and yeah, this isn't going to do a lot of damage to the horse, unless, of course, you happen to be working on the horse, and the horse backs up and pokes his butt into it and jumps forward because it, it pinches him. Uh, I have another picture uh, I didn't put in here. I'd never even thought about it, but I have something similar to this where Melissa was working on, the, on a horse, and I looked over in the stall, and there's a hole about this side, and there are yellow jackets, stinging bees coming in and out of there. I said, Melissa, you got to stop. Because if that horse backed up into it, it was going to get stung or she's going to get stung. Screw eyes that are put up for no reason. They're just hanging there. Uh, hooks that are put up in the past and then no buckets are hanging. They're all, they're all problems. Here's some nails. Uh, these are pretty high above the horse's um, head, but they're still nails. They should come down. Uh, here's another pet peeve of mine. People build doors and leave a, a gap this much down here. This is like six inches. And a horse will lay down, get their hind foot out of here, and then they try to get up, and I guarantee you the door doesn't break. So these are a huge danger. If you're going to have a stall that has a gap down here, make it a whole foot. Otherwise, don't do it. All right. I'm going as fast as I can. We've already shown you this uh, stall wall, the 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 board coming down. I just want to show it to you again because, again, how long would it take for you to go in there and fix this? And I got to tell you, I went back to this same place for over two months and this board was left there with a horse in there. That's the, the point I'm trying to make. It takes energy to fix these things. Here, somebody used some uh, woven uh, rebar as a stall door or guard. Uh, and look at these open exposed ends on the bottom and on the edges, something for them to catch on, something to um, get uh, their clothing caught on, their halters. Uh, this guy was behind this uh, soft steel uh, woven wire, and it's just been beat. And you can imagine a horse kicking this and getting his foot through there, or just he takes his front teeth and he charges and he hits it, and he bangs these things out. And uh, they've got to be they've got to be doing damage. And look how dirty it is. <clears throat> here's some chicken wire that uh, somebody put up between two uh, horses chicken wire is, is good for chickens not for horses and they've torn this out and these are the ends that are just poking out that can poke into their eyes and then to keep the two horses from finding each other they actually extended it out with this wooden frame thing with chicken wire on it and you can see how destroyed the chicken wire is and they've already chewed the end of this off I mean there's got to be something uh, that can be done to make this a better environment for these horses, to make them more comfortable. But this is um, a slipshod at best. Then, of course, <clears throat> here's a chain that's just kind of keeping the horses away from each other from a common waterer, which just makes no sense at all. It's draped down. It's on the ground. Uh, I'm not too sure exactly uh, what's going on. Maybe this person's into metal with the piping that they use for the fencing. I'm not sure. But this, to me, doesn't look right. I've got another picture of two horses on each side of this drinking out of the same uh, watering thing at the same time. And it just looks like it shouldn't be like this. But I want to show you one of my biggest pet peeves. Look hard. This is just grass that's grown up on a, on a harrow. And this is just really weird because I was at a, a person's house on Friday, and I found the same thing uh, just laying there. And they're oblivious to the danger. A horse gets loose, gets in here, gets their foot tangled up in this, and it's all over. My wife and I have developed a way that we hang our harrow up on the sidewall of the tackle, and we actually bought a block and tackle. We hook it up, and we just kind of raise it up, and it gets it out of the way. It's never a problem. But this is just an accident waiting to happen. Okay, we're on the last home stretch. i got about eight more, ten more of these things. Uh, <clears throat> miscellaneous safety. Uh, a lot of people like to have the horses come out here and just drink from the pond, and that's really good. Uh, I really have no problem with this. Um, there, there are some advantages and disadvantages of it, but <clears throat> some of you live where um, 
and my son is saying gators. Uh, yeah, gators down here. That's 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 a problem. You know, it's true. There's wildlife down here. Uh, ponds can be fairly deep. A horse slips and goes in, but I've also seen horses swim just fine. So I'm not really going to say a lot about that, but ice is another thing. And I had to walk down to this barn in the middle of winter, and I hugged the corner where it was still okay, but this was a solid sheet of ice, and th this will kill a horse in a, in a heartbeat, certainly break its leg. And you have to be being careful attention to ice and have some sort of plan that takes care of things when it dips below zero. Here you can see on the lower right-hand side the fat, furry uh, pony, and you see the pile of ice. Uh, it requires a little extra effort to go out there and break the ice off the buckets uh, because whenever you have ice, uh, that's a safety problem because if you don't take care of that ice, these horses can dehydrate. And so you need to knock the ice out, get rid of it, and make sure they have plenty of water, access to water, <clears throat> uh, because, again, they're not living in a natural environment when they're living with uh, humans. Uh, there's another thing called lightning. Um, I, I've got a pick on just about every woman out there, and I don't know what it is, but boy, every woman I know that owns a horse has got one eye peeled out to the clouds to see what's going on, and the other eye on their app to see the, the storm clouds coming in. And the first sign of lightning, I mean, I've seen lightning come out of clear blue skies, and it'll strike a horse dead, uh, and you as well. So when you see the storm clouds coming, uh, consider getting them in. I was stuck in this barn. Uh, the rain was pouring down so hard, it was a river uh, that just formed out there, and um, the lightning was just striking right outside the barn uh, and shaking us. It, it was pretty scary working that day. So be paying attention to uh, weather conditions that can change suddenly, hail, um, uh, sleet, anything like that. And, of course, on the flip side, uh, we can have de dehydration from uh, – the land's dehydrated. This is our pond in our house, and you can see how deep our pond is, and that's all that was left in it uh, during our drought. Um, and so you have to make sure that you have plenty of water. Uh, plenty of you guys live in an area where you don't have a lot of water. So it goes from abundance of water and flash floods down to um, uh, complete drought. Um, and, and finally, as far as water goes, um, this is a system, uh, and I've seen plenty of places actually take water out of the ground and run it through these filters and through the charcoal filters before it goes off to the barn. Um, and this is a good idea if your water is intolerable. You have to have a good supply of drinking water to your horses. And uh, this is part of barn safety, uh, making sure that your horse has a safe place to drink. Okay, gang, uh, there's some pretty scary things hanging around the barn. And... Uh, this is one of them, uh, but I don't think it's too much of a danger to your horse. But one thing to note is safety takes more work than money. Um, yes, it would be nice to hit the lottery and have a, a beautiful place as some of these farms that I go to are just gorgeous. Put in sprinkler systems, fire detection, uh, all this kind of stuff. But most of the safety things can be taken care of, and horses and humans have lived generations with not having these fancy things, but taking the effort and going in there. And, um, and taking care of things. You, you just can't be uh, lazy. And I'll tell you what, safety is really, really cheap. Horses are in a man-made environment, and we owe it to them to keep them safe. So how long is your list now? I hope you've been writing madly as we go. Maybe stop this if you're watching the recorded seminar and writing down all the things that are uh, in your barn that you can think of that you're going to go out and take care of. Uh, how can you make your barn safer? What I want you to do is write me and tell me what bats you uncovered on your farm and what you did about it, okay? And if you do, just write it down someplace, polish it up so it looks good because I'm going to have this on my website. I want you to go to theequinepractice.com forward slash safety, all right? Theequinepractice.com forward slash safety, and that's where this webinar is going to uh, – webcast is going to reside, and you can watch it over and over again but I want you to put it in the comment section. I want everyone to learn you know, what you did to make your place safer and how you felt after doing that. So enjoy your favorite beverage and reward yourself for not only being your horse's advocate, but inspiring other people. Okay, so join the Horses Advocate movement. Uh, just go to thehorsesadvocate.com. Please just go to thehorsesadvocate.com, uh, become a member. It's free. 
Um, the only reason you become a member is just to acknowledge that I'm not your veterinarian, that the stuff I'm giving you is uh, just some roundabout stuff that you get in a magazine anywhere. Uh, but you're going to get a lot of good advice. All these pictures that you saw today are on the website. You can study them. You look harder. And I've got so many. I've got like 6,000 pictures on there. It's just crazy and tons of videos. Uh, you won't be disappointed. And, and again, did I mention it's free? Also, if you like what we do and you like this kind of picture of us working on an unsedated horse with out of mouth speculum using horsemanship skills, just go to equine dentistry without drama.com, equine dentistry without drama.com, and uh, book an appointment with us. Um, that's a great way to get a hold of us. If you like some of the things that I do, there's the equinepractice.com forward slash books. And there you can find my uh, 10 irrefutable laws of horsemanship. It's what I use um, every day to connect with a horse in 30 seconds because we don't have 30 days or 30 minutes. Do what Melissa's doing right here with this horse. This uh, 10 irrefutable laws of horsemanship. You can also get since the days of the Romans, uh, my journey to discovering a life of, with horses, my autobiography of how I uh, dropped out of three college schools and uh, overcame dyslexia and uh, ended up going to Cornell, uh, becoming a veterinarian, and do what I do right now. And of course, if you just want to be entertained, you can get true and incredible stories of a horse vet where everything is in there is true and incredible and uh, stories from my past. So if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to send them to me. You can uh, always go to um, just go to the equinepractice.com and leave a comment there, um, and we'll take care of any questions that you might have. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, this is Doc T, and uh, thank you for becoming your horse's advocate.